Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and a bunch of other things. And with us today, as always, we have Tessa Emily Hall. Tessa, say hi. Hello. Um, I am Tessa Emily Hall, and I am an author of young adult fiction and nonfiction, and I work in publishing as well. And as always, with us is our host, uh, Molly Jo Reilly, with the f- still quasi new novel Nola released. And uh, how's that going? How's that it's, going? Thank you, Aaron. It's it's really exciting. Um, sales have been steady. You know, of course, the first week they really balloon, and since then they've been steady. But not not only that, but just the the excitement that the story's building and the feedback I'm getting from everyone. So I have publicly announced this, but not on the podcast. And there will be some sort of either a sequel or a spinoff. So if you don't have your book, get it, read it, be prepared, and look for the next one in six months to a year, because now that I know what I'm doing, it shouldn't take seven years to write another story. Well, good. (laughs) Yeah, if you make your readers wait seven years, they tend to get a little snippy. So. Since I already have the story in my head, like the whole thing, and I don't have to, you know, I'm not raising a kid and sending her off to school and college and married life. So pretty much, I think I have a little bit more free time. I'll be able to actually get it done in a timely manner for everyone. Yay. Awesome. That sounds excellent. Well, we are uh, talking today, since you're talking about starting a new project, we're actually talking today about what to include in the first chapter of a book. So uh, Mm -hmm. Molly... You want to take it away? Yeah, I, well, the first question that a lot of our readers are going to want to ask is why is the first chapter so important? So there are are lots of reasons that a first chapter is important. I, I tend to think that the first page, even the first line is really important. I wrote a book called First in Fiction, podcasts called First in Fiction. Um, the idea is you want to make a really good, solid first impression. Um, it's, you know, I've equated it to kind of going out on a blind date or a first date. You really want to kind of impress your reader. Um, that's not to say that you want to like show off. You, you don't want to overdo it, um, but you do want to kind of put your best foot forward. You do want to um, present the, the the aspects of your writing that you're most talented with um, in order to kind of bring the reader into your world um, so that they kind of get a sense of, of who you are as an author what kind of story you're going to tell, how you're going to tell that story. Um, and, and really kind of that first chapter is kind of that, that matchmaking process, so to speak. Um, there are several very good books that I don't necessarily enjoy reading. Um, and, and that first chapter is kind of that opportunity to read it and get a sense of if the author's style is right for you, um, if the uh, content of the book is going to be appropriate for you as a reader. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to, to kind of get the, the matchmaking process there started. Well, how long should the first chapter be? If you're trying to put so much into it, are there any guidelines for that? Go ahead, I would Tessa. say, yeah, I would say that this depends on the genre. Um, so there are different guidelines depending on whatever genre that you write. So, For fantasy, the first chapter tends to be a little bit on the longer side. Um, For contemporary, it's shorter. And especially if you write like young adult fiction, contemporary fiction, um, the word count tends to be on the shorter side. And of course, this can vary from book to book. Sometimes authors um, have different stylistic opinions and choose to have even, you know, really short chapters. Um, And some authors like to have longer chapters. Of course, I would suggest whatever you choose to try to keep that um, the same length throughout the book. So to have, if you choose like 2,000 words to 3,000 words for the first chapter, that you try to keep that um, up with every single chapter throughout the rest of your book. Um, And try, just the main thing is that you want to make sure that you include everything that needs to be included within that first chapter so that that first chapter, um, you know, reels in the care in the, the reader in a way that prompts them to continue, want to continue reading the book. So you both mentioned content that, that it should be gripping, compelling, you know, bring the reader in, but what specifically can writers include in the first chapter? 
You want to include several things. And um, I mean, the rest of this podcast really is going to be devoted to uh, the different things that you want to include. But uh, I, I want to kind of caution our listeners against trying to do all of this at great length. Um, if you're if your first chapter, if you're trying to do all of this, your first chapter is going to kind of balloon up to, you know, 50 to 75 pages. If you're, you know, really trying to get real deep, you don't want to do that. The The key is to be able to do all these things, hopefully all of these things, but in a very kind of efficient manner, kind of, uh, yeah, I guess efficient is the best word that I can think of. I was trying to be less efficient with my words apparently and and say use a lot of them but you want to be efficient um and and the first thing that you really want to include is the character that your reader is going to connect with so specifically the protagonist um it's an interesting thing uh that it that whichever character you begin with it, the reader will assume that this is a protagonist. So even if you start from some sort of secondary character's point of view in chapter one, uh, and then you switch, the reader is going to expect that the main character is actually the one that they read in chapter one, uh, unless you, you kind of make that clear. That's why a lot of times you'll see people begin with like a prologue, um, though some people say prologues are bad. Uh, it's, it's one of those kind of industry things where uh, the first chapter is usually told from the perspective of your protagonist. And okay. another yes. thing, yes. Mm -hmm. So another thing that you want to make sure that you include is um, the setting in the story world of the book. So make sure that this is introduced early on in the book, um, where the story is going to take place, or at least the setting of the the main character's current home world, which is basically um, where they are when the story begins and what their regular day-to-day -day life looks like. Um, so for example, with The Hunger Games, it begins with Katniss, the main character. It begins with her hunting and she's just in her normal everyday life. And we are introduced to her, um, to that kind of setting, to that story world before we are then launched into the actual games, which um, the reaping, of course, is what ignites that um, and is the inciting incident. But you really just want to make sure that you've set up the setting for the, for the readers, um, any kind of story world rules. Of course, you don't have to explain everything in a narrative dump kind of format, but make sure that the details are woven in throughout the first chapter. So, um, so you have that foundation there. Yeah, the, the, we talk a lot about reader expectations and aligning reader expectations, which is why we say the first chapter should be roughly the same length as the chapters that are that are following. Um, and that's one of the the expectations, if you will, of fiction is that you can establish uh, normalcy, which which is what you're talking about, Tessa, this home world idea, what's normal in the home world, uh, but you also have to. Um, upset that in some way. You've got to change it. Frodo has to leave the Shire. So you can show uh, Bilbo's 111st birthday, uh, and that's fine, but eventually you got to get Frodo out of the Shire, and so something has to upset kind of that normalcy, which we sometimes refer to as the inciting incident. That can take various different shapes. We'll get to that a little bit later, but um, the other expectations that, so there are reader expectations. You want to align the reader to, to know what to expect from the book. But as writers, we also have to understand reader expectations, and that comes from genre. So if we're writing a mystery, um, it's, it's typically understood that we're gonna have a dead body in the first page, or in the first few pages, or at least in the first chapter. Uh, if you're writing fantasy, you have a little more space, a little more time, a longer chapter to really develop the setting because fantasy readers are very interested in setting and they like to see that. Uh, really emphasize the world building. Uh, romance, you're probably going to introduce in the first chapter uh, at least one of the romantic leads, if not both. You might have two different points of view or perspectives within the first chapter. Uh, and so we should see them. Um, they'll probably meet in some way. Um, or uh, we'll at least get a sense of their lives being unhappy and, and them being lonely or whatever the case may be. 
sci-fi, we're going to see some sort of fancy technology, uh, all those types of things. So it's, it's good to know what the reader expectations are going to be um, so that you can kind of address some of those in the first chapter as well. I want to interject before we go on that these are guidelines and not rules because NOLA is a romantic mystery, does not introduce both leads in the first chapter, and only hints at the mystery. There is no dead body in the first chapter. And uh, I think Aaron, because you read when I thought, oh, this is a mystery, I'm going to have the dead body in the first chapter. And I just put it out there on like page one and it was stupid writing. It was bad writing, so I took it out. <laughs> it has to work for your story. <laughs> yes. It, it does have to work for your story. <laughs> and um, it does have a lot to do with kind of industry expectations. And so yours doesn't necessarily fit into that neat, tidy little mystery type of bow. You do have a lot of right. mystery in yours, but you know you can easily call yours a romantic suspense. Exactly, um, which and is I fine. Do hint at it. I do. There is. There are hints of you know something's not quite right in the first chapter, in the first few pages. It's just you know building up to what mystery expect mystery reader expectations. It's not going to be in the very first two pages. So. And I guess I should have qualified, not just simply said mystery, but specifically murder mystery, like specifically ah, kind of cozy, yeah. cozy mysteries. That's where you're going to yeah. have the, the body on. Uh, you can write mysterious fantasy. You can write mysterious sci-fi. You can do any of that. But uh, I guess I probably should have made that clear. Murder mysteries will typically have a dead body in the first chapter. Right. So. Yeah, because oh. when it comes to like commercial fiction, like these different genres, there are different things that readers will expect whenever they pick up a book, like a murder mystery kind of book. And so there's different formulas. Um, I know people don't like that word, but there are different formulas that authors of each genre should abide by if they hope to build a readership within the specific genre in a way that appeals to that specific readership and also in a way that um, can hopefully grab the attention of an agent or a publisher because you're going to be abiding by those specific guidelines. Right, right. That makes sense. So what else should we include? So uh, Tessa, I'm actually curious about this because we mentioned, we talked about this idea of this hook. Um, and as a, a first lines kind of a guy, I think that there should be some sort of hook within the first page, specifically the first line. And a hook doesn't necessarily mean some sort of um, gimmick or trick right. um free money now that you're listening I, i'll talk to you about you know like I, that's kind of disingenuous and it's not great uh but the writing itself should be the hook it should be well written uh and it should uh, sound good um and it that should be the hook the mm -hmm. the question that i have for you is is how do you feel about hooks at the beginning versus hooks at the end are you kind of the cliffhanger do you think that first chapter should end in kind of a cliffhanger it depends on what works and what doesn't. Of course, it doesn't need to be used just for the sake of tricking the reader. Um, it needs to make sense for the story and also the genre. Um, so whenever I say hook, I mean that whenever as an agent and also an acquisitions editor, um, I, whenever I open a submission and start reading a manuscript, I want to be hooked into the story. So the writing needs to hook me in, but also the plot itself. And this is especially important if you write commercial fiction as opposed to literary fiction when the emphasis is especially on the art form and the character journey. But whenever you write commercial fiction, the, the plot, it needs to reel me in immediately so that I can get excited about the story that I'm about to read and about um, the journey that the character is potentially going to take me on. And I want to know, am I going to want to invest hours into reading this book? And readers are going to need to know this as well. Um, so, of course, readers of different genres expect different things. And they also, there's a lot of competition in, um, on the bookshelves nowadays. And so we need to craft a hook in a way that um, can stand out from other authors and other books and in a way that um, tempts them to keep reading and not to put down the book and just try another um, book instead. So you want to grab them in, and you do this by choosing the right place to start your story and also through hooking them in with the writing as well. 
Which we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later too, is this idea of conflict and, and internal conflict versus external conflict. We've done several casts on that, but um, knowing where to start was a, a, a interesting thing that you said. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut talks about starting as close to the end as possible. Um, what that means is you do want to establish the sense of normalcy, but the reaping is coming and we need to get to that reaping pretty quickly. Um, and so that in itself becomes a type of a promise to the reader. Again, aligning reader expectations. I, I've mentioned the reaping. You're going to see a reaping. And it's probably this character that's going to end up um, with her name being called. Uh, Suzanne Collins does a good job of setting that up, that her name has been put in the hat several times. Um, and she's okay with that because she doesn't mind getting called as long as it's not her, her sister. Uh, so she kind of establishes all that kind of stuff. And that's in so doing, she's establishing the world, the normal world for Katniss, but she's also kind of getting that hook, that hook, that promise of things to come, uh, that conflict that's, that's going to be uh, coming very soon. Um, right. Yeah. It's a hint of conflict to come. And it also begins with action. So it doesn't just begin with her sitting around or walking along the street and, um, just events happening at her and says she's being active. She's an active character who's not allowing stuff to happen to her, but she's actually making decisions. And this is just important for readers nowadays because you, when you start reading a book, you don't want to be bored. You don't want to be tempted right. to put the book down. Right. Um, and people are accustomed to watching movies, watching TV shows, watching really short YouTube videos. And so they're accustomed to the style of, having that action begin immediately and having that conflict set up at the beginning of the book. Um, so that's just something that especially authors of commercial fiction need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've read a lot of books that start with people just sitting down doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, we may want to just sit down and read, but it's really boring to sit down and read about somebody who's sitting down and reading. Right. Um, there needs to be a purpose. <laughs> yeah. Let's get, let's get something going here. Yeah. Um, another thing that you want to establish is, is the point of view. Uh, you'll do that in the first chapter and you, you kind of have to just by virtue of writing that's going to be established. But the reason I bring that up is because um, if you are alternating perspectives chapter by chapter, that needs to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the first chapter uh, within the first line of your second chapter, it should be clear that you're writing from a different character's perspective if you are switching to a different character perspective. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the first point of view that you're establishing is going to be your protagonist's point of view. Maybe that's in first person. Maybe it's third close. Yeah. Um, maybe a cat's going to jump up on my lap here. Hello. <laughs> She's so the kind it, of iris behind I'm, me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting attacked here by my cat who wants to be loved, apparently. Which um, is you, Mystique or yeah, Virginia? It's Mystique. She's, of course it is. Yeah, she knows I'm podcast. So moving on. Uh, the, the point of view, like the point of view of your cat uh, just wanting to be loved, um, <laughs> jumping up on your lap in the middle of the podcast. Uh, and then in the second chapter, maybe you need to establish the, the alternating point of view where uh, I'm trying not to be irritated with my cat. Um, but, you know, You're not irritated with Misty. She loves her daddy. She, she loves her daddy, yes. So uh, there's that. Uh, so the establishing of the point of view. And Tessa, you spoke of this a little bit earlier about this idea of the hint of the goal or the inner need. Mm. So, yeah, how do you do that in the first chapter? So basically the two work together. So my character's goal for this story is the external goal that she's going to be reaching throughout the entire story. And sometimes this um, doesn't come into play until the inciting incident sparks it into action. But the in inner need that she has is actually what's going to motivate her and compel her to, um, to forming this goal and to going on this specific adventure. So for example, you want to set up set this up within the first chapter so that the reader can know what this story is going to be about and what they might be able to expect from the journey that the characters want to go on. Um, so again, for example, think of maybe the char a character who inner need is that they just won't define love. They won't have some sort of um, romance in their life. Um, 
And so maybe a, an inciting incident is going to happen. Maybe she meets, of course, this would be a typical romance story, but she'll meet a guy and um, have the opportunity to maybe be in a relationship. That's just a really kind of vague example, but it kind of shows how the inner need is going to mirror the external goal that she goes on, uh, I mean, that she tries to reach, and that's going to be ignited from that inciting event. Mm -hmm. And the uh, inciting incident that we talked about, like you say, it, that's kind of a good transition. It's just something that happens. Um, this is, when we talk about the three-act structure, uh, it's not necessarily the end of act one, but it's, it's, it's kind of close. It's this idea that um, things are changing, okay, and through a series of events, the character's life has changed. So there's a promise of a journey. Mm -hmm. The ring comes to the Shire and has to be taken out. Um, Bilbo's leaving. He gives the ring to Frodo and some bad news is coming with this ring. Uh, Katniss Everdeen uh, can't just go hunting anymore because now her sister's name has been called at the reaping. Um, th there's got to, there should be something that propels your character forward, that moves them forward. It's ideal if it's one of the, the things that really works with the Hunger Games is the fact that it's, it is an active decision that we talked about from Katniss. Katniss makes a decision um, that she's going to go in place of her sister. I volunteer as tribute like that. The reason that works on a fiction level is because um, the, the normal life is upset um, and we get the promise of a journey. She's going to be going to the Hunger Games. And it's all based on a decision that she is making in kind of a time of crisis and peril. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't have to be life-threatening. You don't need to have someone pull a gun on your main character at the end of the chapter um, if, it, if that's not what would actually happen. You don't want to force it. You, again, this comes back to this idea of picking the right moment in which to begin, picking the right place and time to begin your story. You want to begin as close to that inciting incident as possible. As a matter of fact, what I would do is I would take a look at, at your work in progress, whatever it is that you're working on, find that inciting incident and figure out where it happens. If it's not happening, you know, at the end of chapter one or somewhere nearby, you may want to kind of reconsider where you're beginning. Maybe your first chapter that you have so far is just kind of a prologue. Maybe it's a warm-up chapter that you're not actually going to put in the, you know, the final published um, book, which is fine. Uh, but whatever the case may be, kind of ask yourself, where does this story turn from my character wanting something to my character having to do something, if that makes sense? A lot of writers actually will write like two, um, their first two chapters and then realize that their story doesn't actually begin until that third chapter. So maybe evaluate your chapters and the storyline in the first chapter and the second chapter and see if maybe you they can just be done without. Maybe you can just cut them and just start the story with a third chapter. Um, and also, again, keep in mind your genre because when it comes to like young, young adult fiction and middle grade fiction, the inciting incident typically appears in the first chapter. Sometimes it's even on the first page. Sometimes it's a reaction to that the main character has to the inciting incident after hearing news um, from the inciting incident. And so just keep that in mind as you um, try to brainstorm where to, to begin your book and where to place that inciting incident. Just um, try to do it as early as possible, but also keep in mind what the um, expectations are for, for your specific genre. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've learned in, in that when you're, if you belong to a critique group, your alpha readers, your critique group are really good at spotting that. You know, mm -hmm. when, when I first started writing Nola, I just wanted to tell the whole story, the, the, her, why she was feeling the way she was, all the backstory stuff that was just backstory. It wasn't really important. And my critique group was really good at saying no, like, just like you said, Tessa, the story actually started in chapter three. So right. I found a way to weave the information from chapter yeah, three exactly. through the story without telling it right up front. And it didn't need to be told up front. What needed to be told up front was, boom, she's on her way to New Orleans. And then it became, 
why, what's going on, how is she feeling, thinking, doing, so. Yeah, sometimes the first two chapters are just us trying to discover the story and the characters in a backstory for ourselves, and so sometimes, I mean, it's okay to allow us, allow ourselves to write all that with the intention of knowing that we're not going to actually use this, but we can use it to influence the actual story that we're going to write. It's, it's warming up before the concert. It's warming your voice up before the concert. Um, it's stretching before participating in your sport. Um, whatever that may be, a lot of times those first chapters are just that. It's just figuring out the story, getting a handle on the backstory, just getting words on page, kind of getting back into the habit. Um, and all the things that, that need to be done, uh, it's just a, a matter of, does, is that going to stay? Do you want to <clears throat> fight to keep that in the book? And a lot of times you, you may not want to. Um, if chapter three is a better start, let's go ahead and start there. And then you can kind of go back through and, and figure out, you know, does it still make sense? What, what areas am I going to need to, uh, to um, fix for this to make sense? But uh, that's a, a very good strategy for writing a good first chapter is just to write three chapters and then start at chapter three. Mm -hmm. uh, Heming Hemingway did that in uh, The Sun Also Rises. Yes. Which is, yeah. That's considered his best opening ever. And it's actually chapter three. And he tore out the first two chapters after mm -hmm. um, uh, Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald, told him to take him out. Or actually, mm -hmm. Fitzgerald told him that chapters one and two needed work. And so Hemingway just, just took just him out. Them. Just ripped him out. <laughs> I love <No>. Hemingway. <laughs> Yeah, he's he was a piece of work that guy. So, uh, and another thing that that you need to do in the first chapter is you need to set the tone of the story. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, I mean, tone. People think like, oh, tone of voice, where you're always going to be angry or something. That's not exactly. Like, I mean, it isn't. It isn't. You want to establish like the the basic mood and emotion of the book. So if the book is like an inspirational, a light kind of read, then that needs to be obvious to the reader from the beginning. Of course, they should probably have a basic understanding of that um, just going into the book, especially from the book cover and that sort of thing. But just like the book cover sets the, so the tone, the generic tone of the story, also the first chapter is going to reflect and mirror that tone. And of course, that should be reflected throughout the entire book as well. So it just needs to stay consistent throughout the book. Um, but yeah, you need, just need to introduce that kind of mood at the, in, within the first chapter. Is it a comedy? Is it a dark comedy? Um, you know, is it going to be very insightful and deep? Um, is it going to be playful and fun? Um, those types of things. And so, yeah, it, it is, like you say, the tone of voice. It is kind of like that. Uh, you are establishing mm -hmm. your style as an author. Um, are you really descriptive, a lot of imagery, or are you a, a little more minimalistic, just kind of plot driven, trying to get through um, and tell an interesting story, not necessarily focusing on um, the craft or, or the language, but you just want to kind of tell a compelling story? Is it a combination thereof? Uh, so that's that's kind of what we mean when we say setting the, the tone of the story, uh, establishing the author's style. Yeah, you don't want to have a one tone at the first chapter, like a dark tone, and then the second chapter be all comedic. That would be really confusing for the reader. <laughs> so make sure that it's just consistent throughout. Well, yeah. unless you're writing a book that has multiple personalities to it, then that would be kind of fun. But <laughs> otherwise, I'm not, I think it's probably a very niche audience for something like that, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and even then, again, it goes back to kind of establishing reader expectations. Um, mm -hmm. If you're alternating points of view, there's going to be a shift in style, uh, and that's fine. Um, as long as the reader understands that. So if you, chapter one is told from Mary's point of view, but chapter two is told from Sam's point of view, um, those will feel a little bit different. They should. Right. Um, but overall it's still a romance there's still going to be you know those romantic elements and, and uh, those kind of tendencies and and that type of stuff so um it's not a complete shift from fiction to nonfiction in chapter one chapter two like that can get kind of disorienting and jarring but um a little bit of a, a shift is okay 
Yes. And j just another interjection here, but Erin, you successfully wrote a book like that with Kay Morrison, right? Two differing points of view. That is low on the reviews, but, <clears throat> but very well received from those of us who have read it. What's that book about? It's low on reviews? <laughs> doesn't it have like, no, doesn't it have like limited Oh. Reviews? Oh, okay. I thought the you were saying the reviews were bad. Star. No, they're uh, five star reviews. There's just not enough of them. Yeah, okay. So and there are not your, many reviews. All right. Yeah, your publicist was, has not been doing a good job in amplifying book sales. For that. I was um, I was panicking for a moment. I thought, oh, oh no. <laughs> it got bad reviews. I didn't see that. Um, yeah, and, and that, but even, even then with the shift in tone, um, one thing that was really interesting is that um, as we wrote together, our styles, though still distinct and, and unique, um, came to kind of mirror each other a little bit. Um, her voice, it, it, was a, it was a romance. And so as they spent more time together, um, their voices started to kind of influence one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and so though Jeff's perspective was still very clearly told from Jeff's perspective, and Emily's from Emily's, um, a lot of the, the language and the figurative language and the metaphors and the, the way of viewing the world, you could tell um, that the characters were having an impact on each other. So it, it kind of developed throughout the course of the novel. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, um, you did see two different kind of styles and perspectives, um, but uh, both of them were kind of working toward a particular thing. Uh, they both had things that they were working toward. They both had their own inciting incidents um, to kind of get them moving toward each other, so to speak. I have no idea if I answered that well or not. I I hope I didn't sound unintelligible. Mm, it, it confused me. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, it was great. It was great. It, there was a duality of voices in that story, and yet they do mesh together. And as they continue to mesh toward the end of the story, there it's not only the voices are meshing, but they become almost almost a unison context. And uh, it's a very good story. I, I strongly recommend it. But you didn't mention the name of the book. Heart's Song. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm terrible with this marketing stuff. Heart's Song <laughs> is the name of the book. Um, it's my only romance that I've written. Uh, it is a rock and roll romance, so I get to keep my man card. So that's all good, sure. but uh, it is. What, what makes it a rock and roll romance? Uh, the protagonist is a rock and roll star. It's kind of, my wife made me sit down and watch A Star is Born with her the other day under threat of bodily harm. Um, uh. Actually, it was, it was a really good film, but it's funny watching that thinking how similar in a lot of ways it is to Hart's song. Um, for different reasons, different reasons. It's not the same story right. at all, but mm -hmm. the the feel of it um, is somewhat similar. Where A Star is Born focuses more on the female lead to a large extent. Um, our book, Heart Song, it's really more Jeff's story, though it is about Emily also. It's, it's really more about his kind of coping with fame and, and coming to grips with, because it's his, it's him being born. It's him he's the star that's being born rather than um, befriending someone or falling in love with somebody that's kind of going on that journey, if that makes I, sense. I did watch A Star is Born uh, about two months ago. And as I was watching it, I was flashing back to Hart's song and thinking, ah, oh, Aaron never watched this movie. So good job. Yeah. Good job in, in, in watching the movie after you wrote the book and then channeling it back into the publication. I don't it know how you can advise for that, impressive. but well done, well done. <laughs> Very impressive that way, Tessie. He doesn't have that with all Very his work. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of weird. Uh, we are uh, actually running out of time. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, Tessie, you did mention one last thing, which is kind of hinting at the theme. If your mm -hmm. book has a theme, you don't have to necessarily write with the theme in mind, but if one tends to kind of present itself through the course of the writing and you, you have that, um, it might be good to kind of establish some of those things in the first uh, right. chapter. Did you have, you have a, an example here? Yeah, well, typically the theme of the book sometimes comes from the main character's inner need. 
Um, so what it, whatever it is that they're searching for throughout the book, whatever it is that they're longing for, typically sometimes at the end of the book, they end up reaching that inner need of theirs. Um, and I would say for an example of one of my books um, is Purple Moon, the main character you'll see in the first chapter, she is longing for a new beginning for her and her mom. That's her inner need. Um, and then basically the theme of the book is redemption. So it kind of leads into that. Um, and then the same thing with Pride and Prejudice, actually you can have a hint of a theme within the very first sentence. Um, and of course, that's the famous sentence, it is a truth universal, universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And of course, some hints of themes um, are even in the title of the book, Pride and Prejudice, and then the first sentence, obviously, love is a theme as well. Um, so yeah, you can, those are just simple ways to kind of reflect that theme or set up that theme, even in the first chapter of your book. Indeed. Well, that's about all we've got for today. Molly, anything else before we sign off? Not that I can think of, but the usual, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Subscribe. Don't just watch, but subscribe. It'll save you money. It's like getting the magazine subscription instead of buying it off of the newsstand. Wait, yeah. it's already free. But if you subscribe anyway, it helps us with the numbers. Give us a like, give us a shout out, give us a comment, and also leave your questions on social media for Ask the Author because we will still be running episodes with that now and again. All right. You're very efficient with that, so much more so than me. So, well, we thank you all for That's listening. That's what you pay me the no bucks for. That's right. The, <laughs> I pay you the no bucks for that. So we thank you all for listening, and until next time, good writing.